All right, so welcome to part two of Simple Harmonic Motion. Um, in this video, we're just going to take a look at uh, two particular examples of simple harmonic motion, and that is um, a mass suspended from a spring and uh, pendulums. So if you hang a mass from a spring, as we saw last time, it's going to oscillate back and forth. And that, um, that is going to meet the requirements of simple harmonic motion. You might remember that there are two particular um, criteria. And the first is that the acceleration is always directed towards equilibrium. That when you disturb this mass on a spring, it's always going to be trying to get back to that equilibrium point. And the second is that the acceleration increases as it moves away from the rest position. That, that this um, actually increases linearly. It's a direct relationship. <clears throat> so when we have a mass suspended from a spring, um, we can see that um, if I was to hang a mass here from this spring, you can see that it's going to hang down. It's going to stretch out um, more so than its normal rest position. Uh, you can imagine that if I hang a larger mass from that spring, it's going to stretch out more. And so the more force we exert on this spring, the more it's going to stretch out. And this is related by something called Hooke's Law. So Hooke's Law tells us that the absolute value of the force on a spring is equal to um, k times the absolute value of its distortion. So these values here are um, Fs stands for spring force. K is something called our spring constant. And um, we can just call X distortion, which is to say how much we're going to stretch or compress our spring by. Um, you might also see, I'll just mention it here, you might also see um, Hooke's Law written as Fs is equal to negative K delta x, where in this case delta x is just our, our change in distortion, and the negative sign you'll see refers to um, basically the direction of the force. That is to say that when you stretch a spring, it, the force always works in opposition, so it's going to try and pull back, and if you compress a string, uh, spring, it's going to push against you. So, um, <clears throat> so we can see here that, um, that obviously the spring constants of these two springs are the same, but uh, by applying more force, it stretches out more, or it distorts more. So the first question here, if a spring is stretched 15 centimeters by a 45 gram mass, what is the spring constant? Um, so in this case, the spring force would be equal to the weight or force of gravity that's being suspended by the spring. And so uh, Kx being our spring force and Mg being our weight. Solving this for K, we see that K is equal to Mg divided by X, which is um, 0.045 times 9.8 divided by 0.15. And so the spring constant of this spring is 2.9. Now you might be wondering, um, what, would the, uh, what would the units be for a spring constant? Well, if force is measured in newtons, and we see distor distortion is measured in meters, then this must be measured in newtons per meter. Okay, so if we take this spring <clears throat> and we ask how much force is needed to stretch the spring by 50 centimeters, uh, spring force being uh, k times x, uh, we know that it has a spring constant of 2.9, it was 2.94 if you use all your sig figs, newtons per meter, multiply that by 0 0.5 meters, and we can see that it's going to require a force of 1.5 newtons. Let's round that off to two sig figs. Okay, so <clears throat> when these uh, when a, a mass um, gets into simple harmonic motion, so let's take a look at this picture here. If I take this mass and I'm just going to distort, I'm going to bring it from its equilibrium position and um, let it go. Okay, I'm just going to take this mass and I'm going to move it from its equilibrium position and I'm going to release it. And you can see that it's going to move back and forth. It's going to oscillate in simple harmonic motion. If I do the same thing here with the heavier mass, and remember that these springs are the same spring constant, when I release it, you can see that they have very different um, periods of motion. The lighter mass seems to move back and forth more quickly. The heavier mass um, moves back and forth more slowly, which should sort of make sense in terms of the inertia of the two systems. Uh, if we do a side-by-side -side comparison, Maybe if I, I hang equal masses, but in this case change the spring constant. For example, if I change this to a very high spring constant, 
and I let this one go, and I let this one go. Again, when you compare them side by side, though they have the same mass in this case, the heavier spring, or the spring with the greater spring constant, is gonna move back and forth more quickly. It's gonna have a shorter time period uh, as it oscillates. So for any simple harmonic motion, this is true not just of masses uh, on springs, but for any simple harmonic motion, the position, as we saw last time, is uh, follows a, a cosine curve, and so is a, is a cosine function. And we can say that, that the position is equal to a times the cosine of 2 pi times f times t. Now I know this is a little bit uh, complicated, but if we break it down, um, in this case a is our amplitude, which is our maximum displacement from rest, um, 2 pi, we're well familiar with. Uh, the f here stands for frequency, and of course t is time. So if we want to relate our position as a, as a function of time, that's how we do it. Uh, as it turns out, the acceleration is equal to negative a omega squared cosine 2 pi f t. Now in this case, um, if, you can, uh, if you think to uh, rotational motion, omega is something called the angular velocity. And this is something we'll explore when we get to uh, rotational motion. But what I want you to notice is that um, the rest of these formulas actually look surprisingly similar. Now we're not going to go into the derivation here because to get from our position to our acceleration formula takes a bit of calculus and uh, <laughs> I don't think we're going to do that um, today. But um, the point I want you to, to notice here is that the acceleration for anything in uh, simple harmonic motion is just going to be equal to negative omega squared times x. And so we can see here that our acceleration is directly related to our change in position. And that's the key. Okay, so again, I'm not going to get into the derivation, although you could you could do it from this formula. If we're looking specifically for the period of an object on a spring, <clears throat> the period is going to be equal to 2 pi times the square root of m divided by k. And, and um, in this case, of course, m stands for our mass. The k is the same as before. That's our spring constant. And you can see that there's only two factors that are going to affect the period of its motion. Okay, so let's move on to pendulums. Now, um, pendulums are a little bit uh, trickier because um, at first glance, they certainly look like uh, simple harmonic motion. And you'll remember that there's two criteria uh, for simple harmonic motion. The first is that um, it's going to accelerate towards equilibrium. And the second one, as we just saw, is that the acceleration needs to be proportional to its displacement from equilibrium. So let's take a look at a pendulum and see if this matches up with our, with our definitions. Now a pendulum, um, let's look at a quick example. If we take a pendulum, uh, like this one here, and I just I pull it to the side and let it go, you can see that I'm, I've got my equilibrium position here at rest, and if I pull it to the side, it's going to want to move back to equilibrium. And it certainly looks like simple harmonic motion. It's certainly periodic, uh, whereas this mass is trying to fall back to equilibrium, but it overshoots it and swings up to the other side, and so it swings back and overshoots it, and it keeps on going back and forth and back and forth. So it's certainly periodic motion, but as it turns out, it's not quite perfectly simple har harmonic motion. Now let's take a look at, at the forces here. When, um, when I pull this mass to the side, there's a force of gravity pulling it down. And <clears throat> there's a tension force along the string which pulls up this way. Now you can see that those two forces, which are vectors, are not in direct opposition. And so, of course, they don't cancel each other out. And that makes sense because the pendulum is definitely going to accelerate back towards equilibrium. But you could ask yourself, what is providing that acceler accelerating force? If I break this force of gravity into components, so I'm going to resolve these into components, which are, I'm going to say, how much of this force is parallel to the, the, the um, line of the pendulum? And how much of it is perpendicular? So a certain amount of this force is directed perpendicular to that tension line, and a certain amount of this force is directed parallel. And I'm going to call this component Fg perpendicular, and this component Fg parallel. And what you'll find is if you compare the angle that the pendulum makes to its equilibrium position, that will equal this angle theta here in our vector, um, in our vector uh, diagram. 
So the point here to notice is that <clears throat> the tension in the, in, the, in the string here is balanced by Fg parallel. So these two forces, this one and this one, are equal and opposite, and they cancel each other out. The restoring force is therefore equal to Fg perpendicular. And so as we pull this pendulum to the side, um, Fg perpendicular is going to vary with the sine of theta. And so you can see that it's not going to be quite a, um, a direct relationship. So <clears throat> um, the pendulum does not obey Hooke's law of proportional force. Um, and so the pendulum is not technically an example of simple harmonic motion. However, if we look at a specific case where the pendulum, if we look at specifically small angles, so if we look at a theta that is less than 15 degrees, which is I pull the pendulum to the side, but not very much. Now 15 degrees is approximately equal to 0.26 radians. Now if you're not familiar with radians, um, you're gonna need to do a quick uh, review of that topic, but you might recall that one, um, sorry, 180 degrees is equal to pi radians. And so for small angles, less than 0.26 radians, the sine of theta is approximately equal to theta. So the restoring force in this case, Fg perpendicular, which is equal to Mg times the sine of theta is approximately equal to Mg theta. And so for small angles, the force here is directly proportional to the angle that it makes from equilibrium. And therefore, the pendulum exists, exhibits simple harmonic motion for small angles only. Uh, just as an exercise to sort of prove how, um, how, how this is a good approximation for small angles, let's consider this case here. Um, how many radians is equal to 10, uh, 10 degrees? Well, 10 degrees multiplied by pi over 180 degrees uh, works out to be approximately 0.17 four, five radians. And so what is the sign of, of this? What's the sign of 0 0.1745? Now make sure you're in radian mode when you do this, but when you put this in your calculator, it'll spit out an answer that says 0 0.1736. Now just take a look at these two numbers. You can see that for the first, to the first two sig figs, these numbers are identical, and really they're very, very similar. So um, this just sort of goes to show that for small angles, this is still a good approximation. So as long as the period, sorry, as long as the angle uh, of the pendulum is small, the period of the pendulum is equal to uh, t, uh, which is equal to 2 pi times the root of L over g. And L in this case uh, is the length, and g is the acceleration due to gravity. So it's interesting to note um, that the period and frequency of a pendulum depends really only on the length of the pendulum itself. I mean, it varies with g, but to change g, you'd, you'd have to move uh, to a different planet or at least further from this one. Um, and assuming a small angle, the period does not even depend on the mass, which might be a little bit surprising. But if we take a quick look here um, at this animation, let's say I've got this these two pendulum here, and I'm going to change the blue mass to be much smaller than the red one. And I'm going to move it to the side, and just to release it, you can see that as they swing back and forth, um, no, the, the, the different masses don't really seem to affect uh, the period. Whereas if I set their masses equal, but make the blue pendulum longer, when I pull this one to the side and release it, and I do the same thing for this, uh, this blue one here, as they swing back and forth, they're clearly not in sync. They don't have the same uh, period of motion. So a pendulum uh, of length 0 0.5, meters and a mass of one kilogram and a displacement angle of 12 degrees has a period of 1.4 seconds. If the length is doubled, what would the new period be? Well, you'll recall here, so this is, a, this is an example of, of solving proportionally. So I'm going to say, okay, that my first time period is equal to uh, 2 pi times the square root of L over G. And so what happens here is I'm going to create a second pendulum, <clears throat> which is identical to the first, but I'm just going to... Um, uh, I'm going to double the length. And so I'm going to solve this proportionally. I'm not actually going to put any numbers in here, except that I know that t2 is going to equal 2 pi times the square root of 2l over g. Now, I can, uh, I'm just going to rewrite this and try and get this in terms of t1. 
So I could write this. I'm going to take this little um, square root 2, and I'm just going to move it out to the front here. Um, and so I'm going to rewrite this like this. I'm going to take the square root of 2 times 2 pi square root L over G. Now, you know when I do this, that this here is really the same as this here. And you rec can recall that we said that T1 was equal to 1.4 seconds. So essentially what I have is T2 is equal to root 2 times T1, which is root 2 times 1.4, which works out to be 2.0 seconds, which makes sense because the longer pendulum should have a longer period. Okay, um, what is the period of a pendulum clock that has a, a, a length of 0.75 meters. So as we saw, period is equal to 2 pi times the square root of L over G. And so that's 2 pi times the square root of 0 0.75 meters divided by 9.8. I'm assuming this clock is on Earth, of course. And so this works out to be approximately 1.7 seconds. All right, now this last example here. Suppose that the pendulum of length 0.5 meters has a period of 1.2 seconds. What is the value of G? Um, and so basically for this pendulum, let's see if this is on Earth. Uh, T is equal to 2 pi times the square root of L over G. Solving for G, I can move 2 pi to the other side. Uh, T divided by 2 pi is equal to square root of L over G. I'm going to square both sides so I get L over G is equal to T squared over uh, 4 pi squared. And then solving for G, I get G is equal to L times 4 pi squared divided by T squared. And so that is 0 0.5 times 4 pi squared divided by 1.2 also squared. And my answer comes out to be approximately 13.7 meters per second squared. So we can see that wherever this pendulum is, it's not on Earth. All right, that's it for part two.